I personally don't like eggs. And I know that's kind of random, but I'm just not a fan. They don't really taste that good. They kind of taste like sulfur. You know the smell of rotten eggs? It just doesn't smell that good. And something about the whole thing is just very off-putting to me. But I use over 100 eggs a week. I cook all the time. I bake things. I use eggs for dredging. Sometimes I break a couple. The other day I tried to do a four-handed egg crack and obviously broke all of them. But you get the point. I use them all the time, even though I don't love them by themselves. I think the really important point there is that eggs are really versatile. They're such an amazing ingredient and they're something that we need for so many different recipes out there. So just because I don't like eggs over easy or scrambled eggs doesn't mean I don't like eggs. There are so many things that I couldn't cook without eggs. Today, I'll do a dive into one of the applications that people don't talk about often when it comes to eggs and that's cured egg yolks. Curing is essentially a preservation process for food that you achieve by adding salt, which to get really sciencey on you, draws moisture out of the food through osmosis. Then you basically dried the food out a ton and it can last a while that way. A while back, I did that video with cured meat and you can see there was a really nice crust or bark around the whole thing. All that moisture had been sucked out of there, leaving this really thick, hard, but protective crust around the whole piece of beef. Now, this is a really cool and unique thing, but you can do the exact same thing with eggs. And the awesome thing is, once you've cured an egg, you can use it almost like a piece of Parmesan cheese. It'll grate really nicely over anything you want. It can go on soups. A lot of people put it on pasta or risotto. I like to shave some on a little piece of steak and pop that right in, and it gives this nice umami blast on top of your meat. It's almost a little bit creamy creamy and melts in your mouth like a fat. Or you can shred a bunch of it over a pizza, just like you would with cheese. And curing eggs is also really easy. It only takes about 10 minutes to set up and then you wait about a week. Then they're pretty much done. So let's get cracking. To start, I've shipped these duck eggs in from a farm that's pretty far away. It appears here that they were packaged quite well. Now, it looks like I have about 20 of them here, but let me just pull one of them out to show you. Duck eggs are beautiful. I don't know what it is about holding them, but I really, really like them over traditional chicken eggs. They have this beautiful, almost matte finish and glossy white shell. It's really, really hard to describe, but I hope you can tell from just looking here how pretty they are. To start, I'm just gonna slowly try to lift up all these eggs so that I can easily grab them and crack out those yolks when I go to cure them. This really is such a cool way of shipping stuff. And it's almost starting to look like some sort of game of whack-a-mole here. A few years back, I was with the best female chef in the Philippines. She'd actually just won that award a few weeks before, and she was really cool. When she came to the city, she headed to a small Asian market to pick up some of these duck eggs, but they weren't just any duck eggs. They were duck eggs that had a partly fertilized duck inside them. It's a Filipino delicacy called balut. And sure enough, I was peer pressured into eating one. I crunched into this egg that had a partly grown duck inside it. I mean, there were little feathers and just some really unappetizing parts to me in there. But I really didn't want to let anybody down. And I figured I'd experience this delicacy from another country just one time in my life. Now, when I think of duck eggs or even any eggs at all, that's what I always think of. Anyways, we've brought all these up to the top. So let's prepare our salt for curing. To start, we're going to measure out all of our sugar and salt. You need a good amount of sugar and salt for curing. So to keep it easy, I'll go with about five cups of kosher salt, followed by about four cups of granulated sugar. Alongside our duck yolks, I'm gonna cure some regular egg yolks. So I'll do that exact same amount over again, filling up this entire bowl with sugar and salt. Our first step here, will be trying to mix this up a little bit, but don't worry because we're gonna mix it a lot better in a second. Out of our bowl, we'll dump in several scoops of the sugar and salt. When you're scooping, try to get as even of a mixture as possible. But what we're gonna be doing here is gonna more evenly combine them and also get a nice powder. When you're curing, I think it's really nice to have a nice powdery coating. When we fill this up just about as much as we can, place on your lid. Once you've gotten that nice powdery finish, take this off and admire that well-mixed powder. It almost looks like confectioner sugar. To start, let's pour out our mixture evenly across the two sheet trays. In total, however, we're only pouring half the contents of this bowl because we still need enough to cover it up at the end. Using our hands, we'll spread this out so we have a nice even layer across the whole sheet tray. You also wanna make sure that it's deep enough you can make a little yolk-shaped well that'll really nicely cradle that egg yolk. So just keep that in mind and add a little bit more sugar and salt if you need to. I'll start with one one duck egg and one chicken egg. Then on each of my trays, I'm gonna cure 12 yolks. So I'll use the shells to make my nice little indents. Because there are 12, I'm gonna go three across just like this and then four going up the long way. But feel free to brush over your whole tray with your hand and redo everything if you need to redo the spacing. I always find this to be such a satisfying part of curing yolks, especially when you lay down all those beautiful, perfect eggs. Now that we've made all the indents, we're ready to crack the eggs and put those yolks right in there. Under me, I have a trash can so that I can dump out those shells. So I'll crack down my duck egg, which has a slightly thicker shell than a traditional chicken egg. Then I'll open it up and pour that yolk right into my hand. These yolks are huge. I'll crack open a chicken egg to give you a little comparison. In this hand, I have the duck yolk. And in this hand, I have the chicken yolk. 
you can see that there's a vast, vast difference between the two. But I'll start by placing out one of our yolks in each side. The process of laying them all out has begun. Now with these duck eggs, I had about 20 of them. So I had a little room for screw ups when it came to breaking a few yolks. Cause as you probably know, eggs aren't the easiest things in the world to separate. With that said, as I'm nearing the end of placing all my duck yolks down, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous because I only have exactly 12 chicken eggs. I gotta say, these duck yolks are pretty fun to play with and they're quite durable. I'm kind of squeezing this one in my hand as I drop it through every time and it seems to be, oh, it broke. Anyways, I only have 11 chicken yolks left. And those are not very good odds, considering I broke three or four of these duck yolks throughout this process. But I figure you can watch as I go through the rest of these 11 eggs. I'll try to do it as fast as I can. Number one, I'll give it a nice simple crack, break that baby open and pour it right into my hand. Because these yolks are so much smaller, it's a lot easier to roll them around in your hand and pull off all of that egg white. It looks like number one is all set, or I should say number two. For number three, it cracked open almost too easily and it actually separated itself from the white immediately. Jumping to number four, this one is clinging really hard onto that egg white. But I finally got it off and he is all set too. You can see all the dimples on this egg right here and I believe that means it had a calcium deficiency, but I think this one's still okay to cure. The shell seemed a lot thinner, so I do think it had a calcium deficiency. But the yolk held together perfectly and that's all we needed. Now we're at the end here, and this one's giving me some serious trouble taking off the white. I just need to separate it. We're at the home stretch. Why is this guy so obsessed with keeping his egg white? Ah, he released. And our last one, the moment of truth right here. A nice, not very clean crack on the egg. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be absolutely kidding me. The break? It broke. No. On number 12. Oh. Oh no, oh, oh, you gotta be kidding me. The last one, that is just a dagger. I'm gonna check the fridge. You guys, I'm really sorry to do this, and I know this may seem silly, but we gotta put something in that last hole there. The first idea we had was putting Pesto the hamster inside there, but I don't think it'd be good to put him in the refrigerator for a week, encased in a bunch of sugar and salt. I actually think he'd eat everything right here. We're gonna put a little piece of broccoli, cause why not? Once we lay down a couple little bits of broccoli, we're all set, and I think we've done a pretty good job. Although, I would like if this one was fully filled in. Once they're all in here, we're gonna take our little bowl again and just gently cover each egg yolk with some more of the salt and sugar mixture. This is gonna turn into a bunch of little mounds on each of our baking sheets and it looks really cool. As we talked about before, all that salt is basically gonna suck up a bunch of the moisture out of these egg yolks. And they're gonna be these hard, really gratable yolks that you can use on a bunch of different things. It gives that amazing creamy umami blast that I absolutely love. And it's also such a power move if you have a dinner party and grate your homemade cured egg yolks over the entree. What a cool thing to do. I'll continue covering all these up and while I do this, I'm really not sure what I'm gonna do with the piece of broccoli. I figure we just cover it up anyway, right? Once the duck yolks are all covered, I'll move along to the chicken yolks, which should be a lot easier to cover up since they're a lot smaller. I've cured chicken yolks before, and I have to say that it's such a fun and easy process, and that's why I'm doing it again. I wanted to show a slightly longer form video to show you some of the applications you can use when actually having the yolks themselves. Some people look at them and wonder how you could ever use those or why they would ever factor into your everyday life when it comes to cooking. But I have some super cool recipes that you can use, and I can try to talk you through how they taste for you to be able to go and choose which one you'd like to go make. We're approaching the broccoli, and I think at this point it only makes sense to give it a little cover. I want one little mound in the last spot here to make it look like I didn't totally mess that last yolk up. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I wish I was kidding and that I had an extra yolk somewhere around, but I really just don't. Once we've covered everything up, give a nice even coating over the top of everything just to really make sure everything's covered up. I like to say that if you can see any orange in any of your mounds at all, give that a little bit more. You really don't want any situation where your yolk isn't getting enough of that salt to draw out that moisture because then this process simply just isn't gonna work. Once we've evenly spread out all of that remaining salt, you've done it. Once everything's all set, take a big thing of saran wrap and just cover that really, really well. You wanna just wrap the entire thing. Once these are both well covered, we're gonna place these in the fridge to cure for an entire week. If you wanna be really safe, you can even leave them for a little bit longer after that. But the only other step in this process is drying them out a little bit. So we've pretty much done it. And it was pretty easy, right? I'll be back with these in a week. After about a week, our yolks are done. Because I don't wanna break any of these, and unfortunately I can already see that one of our chicken yolks is broken. It's just squirting out the top like a volcano. I'm gonna cut that plastic wrap out on the edges with a knife, which as you can tell is extremely well sharpened. I barely even have to push. I'll open up the chicken yolks and then do the same thing here for our duck yolks. Like I said, 
you can see right here that this yolk has popped and sort of been ruined in that process. But what's really cool with curing is that I can pick this whole thing up and it'll all stay together because we've sucked out so much of the moisture in this yolk that this will pretty much hold together no matter what the shape. So this is actually a really great example to show you what happens when you cure an egg yolk. Now that we've done the drying process, which of course takes the longest out of this whole thing, our first step is actually to dig all of these yolks out, which is definitely my favorite part about this whole process. Once you've taken them out and scrape off all that salt, you'll end up with a lightly salt coated egg yolk just like this. But you're not done just yet because you don't want a bunch of salt hanging off the edges when you go to finally grate this onto whatever you're cooking. So after this, we rinse them in water, but first let's dig them all out. I always used to buy those things where you could slowly chip away at it and pretend you were an archeologist digging away at a dinosaur egg. And this for me is the adult version of that. I'd almost completely forgotten that we'd put a piece of broccoli in here. And once I go to shake this off, you can see that it's extremely, extremely thin. I totally didn't realize that this would give you all such a fantastic example of curing, but knowing that broccoli is so much water and seeing how a thick seven piece of broccoli went down to this tiny thing is really, really cool. I'm actually gonna do this on purpose from now on when I go to cure anything, just to show that example. You wanna stop filming for a quick second? Yeah. Okay. Once we've dug out all these beauties on the top and lay them all right above the salt, I'll pick out the few that I wanna end up taking to the next step. This one is an example of one that I will not be taking on to the next step. Now that we're done here, let's move on over to the duck yolks. With these duck yolks, I wanna be a lot more careful since they're a lot wider. Now, no matter what, they should be really hardened at this point, but it's amazing how much moisture came out of these because all that salt around the edges is no longer dry and granular. Instead, it's almost like snow where it's absorbed all this moisture and I can easily pack it together because of all that water content. Once I I scoop under those duck yolks, you can see that the resulting piece is massive. I'll do the same thing for all of these, digging around the edge and then coming up under them. I actually think the chicken yolks are more fun to dig out because they're a little bit smaller and give you a tad bit more of a challenge when you go to dig them up. But the great thing about the duck yolks is it looks like they all held together extremely well. Though I will give you one note of caution. If you plan on making cured yolks, really make sure you have plenty of salt both under and on top of the yolk. Otherwise you can get these soft, sticky spots, which in reality means that I didn't have quite enough salt on top of this yolk here. Either way though, this will be fine to dry out. Now it's time to rinse these off. To rinse these off is a really simple process. Simply pick up those yolks that are really nicely shaped, give them a quick little dip in some nice cool water, and slowly brush your fingers around the edges to get off as much of that salt as possible. And your result should be this glistening translucent yolk. These have always looked like apricots to me, and they're so incredibly gorgeous. I love how you can almost see through them. Once that part's all set, put it between a paper towel and just lightly pat it dry. Because again, the whole point of this process is been drawing out moisture, so we don't want to suddenly add a bunch back in. Then simply place it down on a baking sheet lined with a wire rack, and this will dry out in the oven momentarily. I'll pick out a few more of my chicken yolks just to make sure we get a nice even spread of these. I also really want to compare the flavor between the chicken yolks and the duck yolks that have been cured. Just so we don't waste too many paper towels, we can use each piece for a couple yolks when we go to dry these out. It's okay if a couple small bits of the yolks rub off in the water when you're taking off that extra salt. But in general, try to keep the whole yolks intact. It's definitely a really satisfying feeling when you get that perfect yolk. So much work goes into these and it's really fun to see it finish up. For our duck yolks, we'll go through the exact same process. Here I'm going to give you a quick little before and after. I dunk this in our water, give it a nice little wipe to get as much of that salt off there as possible, and the resulting yolk is this beautiful, smooth, and shiny yolk. Absolutely gorgeous. It's funny, this just looks like a square egg right now when I put white back around the yolk. But let's give that a nice little dry and lay it on our sheet. I'll pick out a few more nice looking duck yolks and then we're ready to toss this in the oven. And for the record, I'm not gonna be wasting the rest of these yolks that I'm not drying out on a rack here because they'll actually last in the fridge for several weeks, almost a month. More, I really just wanna pick out all the perfect ones because you deserve the best. I'll rinse off this last duck yolk, give it a nice quick dry in my paper towel and lay it down on my baking sheet. At this point, I'm hoping it'll be pretty obvious to you which ones are chicken yolks and which ones are duck yolks. They really are quite beautiful to look at after you've dried them out and in this stage of the process. Because after putting them into the oven to slowly dehydrate at a low temperature, they lose some of that translucency. So again, this is just my favorite part of that process. At this point, we'll put our yolks in the oven between 150 Fahrenheit and 175 Fahrenheit for about an hour and a half or so. If your oven doesn't go to that setting, you can always just leave it there in a closed, turned off oven for a lot longer than that. But I find that it's easier to just stick them in a warm place and let them dry out for a little bit. The main thing you don't want to do is cook them. And by that, I mean letting them dry out at too high of a temperature. Because you'll start essentially bringing this back to an original egg yolk and cooking it in a way that we just don't want. If it starts bubbling or oozing too much, you've probably had the temperature come too high. Let's let these dry and we'll be right back. 
While those yolks are curing, it's time to start getting the rest of our toppings prepared. You already know we have a piece of Wagyu, and it's just not any piece of Wagyu. This is of course Japanese Wagyu, but let's get a little bit more specific. This is A5 Takamori strip lung. It's a 10 ounce piece that, as you can see, is quite thin, but that's because it's one of the best cuts of meat you can get in the entire world. All around this thing, we have perfect, perfect marbling. And you can see that as I get closer, this is one of the most perfect pieces of meat you'll ever see. Now you might ask, why exactly are you gonna be using this on a pizza, Nick? That's insane. Number one, I agree with you. I'm nuts. I'm absolutely crazy and I'm insane. So that could be part of the reason. But at the same time, we've all heard of steak and eggs, right? You've probably seen something where they put an egg yolk with steak and meat because it tastes really good. And you've probably seen people dip really high in meat into a nice egg yolk. And that's because they go together swimmingly. We've spent so much time and effort making these amazing cured yolks. So why settle for a pizza other than the best pizza we can possibly make? For now, I'm gonna set this aside and just before searing off later, we're gonna cut this into strips, sear off nice pieces and add it to the pizza after it comes out of the oven. This is no type of meat that you toss on a pizza before cooking. This is a finishing meat. Our next thing here is gonna be potatoes. So I'm gonna start by peeling all the skin off. And funnily enough, a lot of people don't know these can go back and forth, but they can. And once you figure that out, your life will be a whole lot easier. You'll notice I'm peeling these potatoes over and dropping them into a bowl of cold water here. And that's so that they don't oxidize, but it's also to rinse off some of the starch. I'm gonna end up cutting and cubing these up. But for now, my priority is getting them immediately into this cold water. Again though, isn't it a game changer that you can go back and forth like this? I feel like too many people peel the wrong way. And this makes it twice as fast. The last thing here is, for the record, if I were making mashed potatoes, I'd leave the skins on every time. But once you see what I'm doing with these potatoes later, you'll understand why I have to take the skins off. Now to make them cook a little bit faster, we're gonna cube up these potatoes. When doing that, just try to make sure they're all about a similar shape and size. You don't want some cooking way faster than others. I'm gonna cut them into relatively large chunks, which I'll immediately place right back into my cold water. Again, if we let these sit out for too long, you'll see the same thing happening that you see happen to an apple. And we don't want our potatoes browning at all. Once these are all nice and cubed up, I'm gonna bring these behind me and let them cook for a while. Next, I just wanna make a few caramelized onions. And I'm not gonna be putting a ton on the pizza, but I want enough that we can get some of that sweet sugary flavor. Now I'll be the first to say it. These aren't the prettiest onions ever. In fact, this one looks like someone threw it against the wall a couple times. That doesn't really matter. To prepare these, I'm gonna chop them right down the middle, slice off each end, and then chop it into nice thin bits. And as long as our onions in these nice thin strands like this, we can get them beautifully caramelized. To caramelize our onions, I'll start with a little bit of butter, then a quick squirt of olive oil, and let this melt down for a second over medium heat. Once that's melted down, I'll toss in my onions, then immediately hit them with just a small pinch of salt. Then, I'm slowly gonna start to stir them around and get them evenly coated, and I'll let these go now for a couple minutes, stirring every once in a while. Now to help caramelize these a little bit faster and better, I like to add a slight sprinkle of sugar over the top of my onions. That way, that sugar can help brown everything, giving you richer, deeper, more caramelized onions. At this point, I'll be slowly stirring and letting this go for about an hour to really, really bring out all those sugars. So I'll see you in a little bit. For our white pizza sauce, we're gonna start with two tablespoons of butter, and then while whisking, add in two tablespoons of all-purpose flour. I'll let that go for just a second until well combined, and then I'll add in one and a quarter cups of milk. Technically, if you're making a true white sauce, you don't want that butter to brown at all, because that'll make your sauce a little bit more golden brown than it will make it white. But personally, I like the flavor of brown butter, so oftentimes I let it go until it has a little bit of that golden color. Now, once our milk is in here, we're just gonna stir this for a few minutes until it thickens up. Now, once that's nice and thickened up, I'm gonna slowly sprinkle in about a quarter cup of grated Parmesan cheese, a little pinch of salt, and last but not least, a bit of fresh cracked pepper. Now, I'll whisk all this up until it's nice and well combined, and then just like that, we have our beautiful, thickened white sauce ready to go. You can see that after about a half an hour, these onions are really, really deeply caramelized, but we're not done just yet. We're gonna let this go for another 30 minutes. I want as much of that dark sugary color on them as I can possibly get. Now that our potatoes are steaming and fluffy, we're gonna go ahead and strain these out. Once those are strained, I'm gonna dump them into this glass bowl here. And then this is my little trick that I do every single time I make potatoes. I'm gonna cover them up with a kitchen towel and let those steam in there and get even fluffier. This will continue to happen until we're ready to use these. Now, because we're ready to assemble those pieces, it's time we slice up this Wagyu, because I wanna do this pretty much as last minute as possible. To do this, I wanna take nice clean cuts at an angle on my Wagyu here. This of course should leave us these beautifully marbled thin slices that we can then take and sear off into nice strips for our pizzas. 
Once we've evenly cut a lot of these strips, which I will say look incredible, I'm gonna try not to touch them too much and layer them out on a little sheet here lined with parchment, just so that they're all ready to sear and prepped out for us when we need them. Then we can sear them off. While our pan heats up, I'm first gonna salt all sides of our Wagyu. Note that I'm using really small thin salt and not something like flaky salt, which will actually lift pieces of the steak up off the pan and it makes for more uneven browning all across the board. Now I'll flip these over and do the same thing on the other side. Now once our pan is piping hot, I'll lay down my strips. There's gonna be a lot of smoke from this because that Wagyu fat is gonna melt immediately and then hit its smoke point right away because of how hot our pan is. So let this go for about 15 seconds on each side, getting a really nice hard sear on each piece of beef. And then as quickly as they started, they'll be finished. Layer them right back onto that parchment paper. I can show you here the difference between the golden brown ones and the uncooked pieces of Wagyu. Those have beautiful, amazing color, shrink down a ton because they lose their fat, but they both look delectable in different ways. Now we'll do this with the rest of our Wagyu. Now we have a lot of Wagyu fat left in our pan and we're gonna place this in a bowl and set it aside because this is still gonna go to great use and you'll see why in a few moments. Now what I have here is my pizza. Oh, damn. Now what I have here is my pizza dough. Now what I have here is my pizza dough. Gah. Take number 69. What I have here is my pizza dough. Take a look around this whole container. You see all those air bubbles? That right there is exactly what we want in a pizza dough. And it's not just that container. Here's another one, filled with all sorts of massive, beautiful air bubbles. That will give us a nice, light, fluffy crust. Now, I can put the recipe for the pizza dough in the description, but I figured that would be a long enough section that we could just cut that out, and I'll give you the very straightforward recipe in my description below. Right away, I'll tell you that I wish you could be here to smell this, because this isn't just any pizza dough. This is 72-hour fermented pizza dough. It's sticky, it's gooey, it's fermented, and has that alcohol-y smell. The best way I can describe it is that it smells almost a bit like kombucha. And if you don't like kombucha, trust me, this is still a good thing. I find that this dough reminds me almost a little bit of goldfish and watch as it clings to the top of the lid when I pull this off. To start, we tap them down just a little bit. They're in these containers because like I said, they were fermenting in my fridge for a while and that really allows you to develop that lighter dough in addition to all sorts of flavor that you couldn't get otherwise. This right here is called a pizza peel and on it, we can start by building out one of our pizzas. So first, always flour this quite a bit to make sure that it's not gonna stick. The worst thing that can happen is if you make a beautiful pizza and then when you go to launch it, it gets all mangled. Once that's all set, I'll gently pull out my pizza dough and put it right on top of the peel. I always hit it with just a little bit more flour so we can actually start to work with it here. I find that the best way to stretch it is actually just to let its own weight do all the stretching. I lift it on the edges and in areas that I feel like it's still a little bit too thick. And sometimes I rest it on the back of my hand as I slowly spin it around itself. Usually the hardest part to push out is the area right near the crust. But stretching out this dough is actually a really easy process, unlike some of the ones that I've bought at the market before. Trust me, folks, if you're putting in the effort to make your own pizzas, you'll want to make your own dough. Now, if you really want to look like a pizza extraordinaire in front of all your friends, collect that dough over the back of both of your hands and then give it a nice little twirl in the air. After that, it should fit over your peel perfectly. And we're ready to add on those toppings. My first piece of advice once you put this on the peel is always gonna be to lift up those edges and sprinkle just a little bit more flour under it. Before putting on any toppings, you'll wanna shake it back and forth just like this. This will mean we can slide it into our oven and actually go to cook it. And I've had many times where I didn't put enough flour on there and it got stuck, and it's just one of those things that ruins your day. Once we know that it can slide, we'll start by spreading on a little bit of our white sauce. You can see that I've cooked this to be quite thick, and that is for a good reason. When you're making pizza, you don't want too much moisture sitting on the top of the dough. For instance, we're gonna be using Using low moisture mozzarella cheese because otherwise you can end up with this big wet pool in the middle of your pizza and in addition to really burning your mouth easily nobody wants a wet slice of pizza once we've gotten that nice even spread of white sauce which for the record definitely isn't my favorite sauce in the world but works really well with the ingredients that we're using here we'll put on some of our caramelized onions which as you can see are extremely dark now I'm just gonna take little pinches of this almost candied onion at this point and spread it out nice and evenly across our pie this is one of the sweetest most delicious things you can have and it's funny to think that an onion something so pungent it can make you cry while cutting it can suddenly turn into something like this. I can't tell you how important it is to really cook that onion when you go to caramelize it. Now it's time to do our potatoes. What I have here is called a potato ricer and it has all these really tiny holes in the bottom here. I use this all the time for mashed potatoes because it really does make the fluffiest potatoes in the world. Usually when you have potato on pizza, it's in these big fat rings and it's really not spread that well in terms of getting an even bite across the pizza. This fixes that. Now we're gonna add in some of that low moisture mozzarella cheese I was telling you about. Again, that's just not gonna have too much water in it and that way we're not gonna have a soggy pizza. The Wagyu and the egg yolks will come later, but we have one last step right now. 
As a last step, I usually use butter for this, but today I'm using that Wagyu fat. I'm gonna go around the whole pizza and paint that over our crust. Because as this bakes in the oven, the Wagyu fat is going to seep into the crust and almost fry it, giving us a nice, buttery, fatty, flavorful, delicious crust. I've always been sad that people neglect the crust of their pizzas so much, and this is a way of fixing that. Once we've done that, we can add a really light sprinkle of black flaky salt around the edge. One of my favorite go-to seasonings to add to the edge of pizza is actually everything bagel seasoning, but I figure that doesn't go so well with this type of pizza. Once that's done, we're gonna put this on a baking steel in the oven for just a couple minutes at the highest temperature my oven goes. If you don't know what a baking steel is, it's just an easy way to cook pizzas in your oven at home. And it's actually a really close friend of mine who started the company many years ago. If you talk to anyone who makes pizzas at home, they probably have one. I'll be right back with this. Now fresh out of the oven, we have our yolks. You can see they no longer quite look like apricots and it's more of a mixture of this white and orangish color as opposed to just that translucent orange. Once your yolk looks like this, it's ready to grate over just like you grate Parmesan cheese, and you can grate it over anything. You'll see momentarily, but we're gonna be doing one of our pizzas with duck yolk and one of them with chicken yolks, just to see the differences in flavor. And how did the oven our pizza comes? You can see right here that we got that darker color that you might get in a wood-fired pizza oven, and this is just out of my oven at home. And now when I spin this around a little bit, you can see we have that almost thin crust type over here. But one of the most important things to me is that crust. All that Wagyu fat is seeped into this crust, and it's gonna be a mind-blowing pizza. But it's not finished just yet, so let's give it some yolk. I also wanna show you under the pizza where you can see we have that really dark color. And listen to this. We've nailed the pizza on this one. To finish it off, we're making two of this exact same thing, but then putting duck egg on one and chicken on the other. So which came first, the chicken or the duck? Not funny. We're gonna layer down some of our freshly seared Wagyu on this first piece here. Cause again, that's gonna go on both of them. I don't wanna be wasting any of this Wagyu now, but to me that looks like a pretty good spread. Then we'll start with the chicken yolk. As you can see, this is gonna flow out really nicely, just like a thing of Parmesan cheese. It's actually quite fascinating to see something like a yolk turn into this, but it just goes to show you how magic can happen in the kitchen with just a little bit of salt, a little bit of thyme, and a little bit of heat. I'm gonna take one more yolk just to get a little bit more of that on this pizza, because the yolks are the star today. I mean, yes, we have amazing other ingredients that we're working with here, but yolks are the star. Once that's all melted on there and nice and grated, this is complete. And while our pizza here is definitely a slightly different shape than the other one, the beauty is still there. In fact, I actually like this one more. I like to say when I'm making pizzas that the first one's always more of a test, but you can see that the crust on this one was perfectly, perfectly brown, unlike this one, which has some spots that I would like a little bit more crust on. We're not gonna be letting that cloud our judgment here. To start, of course, I'm gonna lay down a couple pieces of our Wagyu beef. We seared off just the perfect amount. Next, of course, we have our amazing duck yolks. So let's get to grating. Because the duck yolk is bigger, I'm noticing that the strands are actually a little bit longer. And noticeably longer for that matter. The important thing here is that they're graining really, really well. And given that fact, these are both gonna be fantastic things to compare with one another. I'll give this just a little bit more of our duck yolk, and then I think we're all set to cut and taste. Before we taste, I also wanna show you the crust on this one, which looks a little bit better too. I like that we have those darker spots under this thing, and it's a nice, firm, crispy pizza. So I'll slide that onto my board. Then I'm gonna come in with my pizza cutter, cutting through both of these. It actually looks like I got pretty clean cuts through the Wagyu, and I'll do the same thing with the second pizza. Listen to this crunch. Because some of the Wagyu moved around a tad bit there, I'm gonna rearrange them slightly so that they're all even bites. But in general, these pizzas are ready to eat. Before we eat the pizza, the last thing I do wanna say is that I think it's really cool that from this large duck egg here, we get this. Yet another one of the many amazing things that happen when you cook. You're always gonna discover new things and the journey is endless and so much fun. But the time has come, we must eat. Because it came out of the oven first, I first wanna try that chicken pizza. I mean, let's start by saying that's a hella good looking slice. Missing one piece of Wagyu, of course. I don't know how you all eat your pizza, but I like to go like this. At this point, I don't really want to talk anymore. Let's just eat. God damn, that's really good. That is a special, special pizza. And I'll tell you why. Here are the things that stand out. Everything, everything stands out. And I totally, completely mean that. The salt level, perfect. We have that really nicely seasoned crust, which we haven't even tried yet. But we also have those rich, deeply caramelized onions, which are just mind blowing. Then on top of that, those yolks do have a teeny bit of salt and they're creamy and hit the top roof of your mouth with that delicious, fatty, eggy flavor right as you take a bite. But what actually stands out more than most things and something I didn't expect is that potato. That layer of potato is perfectly fluffy and leveled across the whole pizza because of using a ricer. And that's one of my favorite things about this slice. Let's do the crunch test. 
Now the great part about this crust is that due to the 72 hour ferment, it almost tastes a little bit like goldfish. It's got a developed cheesy flavor that's so, so unique and it's fantastic. The chicken yolks taste like chicken yolks. They're fatty, very, very tasty, and we got a nice layer up top, but I'm really excited to dive into these duck yolks. The slice I'm gonna pick might look unique, but to me this perfectly resembles that thin crust pizza while still having those nice bubbles across the edge. This is a hot, beautiful, A plus looking slice. First I'll do my bend and then I'll dig in. Oh, that's hot, that's hot. We got ourselves a winner. And I'm not saying that because we waited longer to try that chicken slice. I'm saying that because this is just a clear bomb winner. Let's take a bite of that Wagyu fat thin crust. If this pizza had legs, I would tell it to take a bow. This is one of the single best pizza bites in the whole world. I don't even need to try all the pizzas. I just know. It's hot, it's crispy, it's buttery, it's fatty. And the best part is you can taste all those individual components. The caramelized onions are chewy. The potato is light and fluffy and evenly spread. The crust, perfect crust. And most of all those duck yolks are fantastic. If I take just a little bit of those and put them on my tongue, they almost stick to your tongue for a second or to the roof of your mouth, depending on where you put them. Then they have this really unique, salty, fatty, and creamy flavor that's hard to really get that I really don't know where you'd get anywhere else. What we've done here today is just yet another reason I love food so much. And I've only used these cured yolks in one application out of thousands and thousands, probably millions. You can do whatever you want when it comes to food. There are absolutely zero rules. Again, I wish I could send you a slice of this pizza in the mail because this is fire. I really do hope you enjoyed watching this video. Seriously, I wanna thank each and every one of you for continuing to grow this channel as fast as it's growing. We just blew right past 1.6 million, which I can't even fathom, and we're just gonna keep rolling. And you know what that means, lots more food. Don't forget to subscribe, join the notifications gang, and toss a like, and perhaps a comment if you have ideas, wanna try making these cured yolks on your own, or just have general comments about the video. Maybe you were just really bummed that I didn't put my hamster pesto in this one. Let me hear it, but you already know I got a lot of pizza to eat, so I'll see you soon.